Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If you guys have your Bibles, go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 as we're going to continue in our master class. Um, Jesus uh, in Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7, uh, we have the recordings of His longest sermon he's, He preached. Uh, it was on the hillside on the, along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and we're calling it a master class simply because we are going to be immersing ourselves in the teachings of Jesus for the next several months as a personal and a church-wide master class on how to live like Jesus in today's world. Because we need some, we need some like serious help with that. It's not easy to be living out our faith in the culture that we live in today. And so we're going to be spending uh, quite a bit of time walking kind of verse by verse, section by section throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, if you missed last Sunday, uh, we forgive you. Uh, it's okay. We know life happens. But I would really encourage you uh, to go back and watch on YouTube um, uh, the message from last week. It is a foundational message as I kind of laid out uh, the baseline for what the Sermon on the Mount is and kind of some technical terms that Jesus uses throughout the Sermon on the Mount. So if you want to catch up, you don't have like a whole lot of messages to listen to to catch up, all right? So you can go back and do that. Um, And we started last week um, on the context of the first beatitude. Uh, It's a series of, it's almost like a poem where Jesus lays out um, the, what it means to have a life in the presence of God, in the kingdom of God, and He begins the first beatitude by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we looked at last week how like the foundational verse of all of Jesus' teachings, this whole master class begins with a posture of humility and a posture of saying, God, I am completely depraved. I have nothing in this world, I have nothing good in my heart, and without you, I am nothing. And so life following Jesus and life in the kingdom of God begins with a posture of being poor in spirit, which is the opposite of what our culture wants out of us and what expects of us. And also, if you remember from last week, we learned this whole like, idea of what it means within this master class that the teachings of Jesus are intended to be countercultural. I think we all could admit at some level that we all look a little bit too much like the world that we live in today, and we wish we looked a little bit more like Jesus. Can I get an Amen. And so we need some help with that. And these teachings of Jesus are very, very countercultural. In fact, uh, what I did, uh, I gave you all a little bit of homework. I know all of you did it because you listen to everything that is said from the stage. Um, what I did is I said, hey, would you do me a favor and would you last week read Matthew 5, 6, and 7? And on all of the different teachings in there, will you just write with a highlighter or a pen? It's okay to write in the margins of your Bible. Like, I agree with this teaching. I'm confused by this teaching or I disagree with this teaching. Because these are very, very difficult teachings. In fact, I had two of you uh, send me or talk to me. One was actually this morning said that, yeah, I thought I was going to read the Sermon on the Mount and I was just going to agree with everything because I love Jesus. And I got to one of the sections. I was like, oh, I don't agree with that. That's pretty hard. Another one, someone sent me a text. It was like, yeah, I don't like the one on turning the other cheek because I like to lay hands on people. Um, and, you know, and I thought that was pretty awesome. We're going to, we actually have a, a good funny video that was sent to me that I'll show when it gets to that, that one. So anyway, um, but Jesus begins His master class with this Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes are simply this. The Beatitudes are the eight principal marks of Christian character and conduct and the divine blessing that comes to those who live out these qualities. That's what the Beatitudes are. Now, the first one, and he says that as a result of this, that, that happy or blessed are the people that live in such a way. And for many, then the blessing, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail throughout the Beatitudes, but the blessing is a result of our lives reflecting the values of the kingdom of God. And these next two Beatitudes, this is kind of going to be one sermon in two parts, um, You're going to see, and again, the way that I saw them as I read through them again this week, is I saw them in light of uh, a struggle that I think many of us have 
in our faith living in today's world. And these, two, these next two Beatitudes speak into the Christian response to a couple of cultural norms. And the first one is this, is that we live in a world, and you and I can be indicted in this as well, that we believe that the problems of this world are out there. That's someone else's problem, right? They're the ones that are messed up. She's jacked up. He's jacked up. He's the reason why we're in this position. She's the reason why we're all jacked up. It's someone else's problem to fix. Jesus is going to turn that back around on us and say, no, no, the Christ follower first looks at themselves before they go and cast blame in other places, right? We live this situation, well, I'm not the broken one. She's the broken one. I'm not the messed up one. That's where the problem is. It's not here, it's out there. And Jesus is going to address that in the first beatitude. And the second beatitude um, really kind of talks about this issue of power and strength. And we live in a world that, re- that rewards power and strength, right? Right? Yes or no? Yes, right? We, we reward power and strength in the kingdom of this world. And as Christ followers, I think we've bought into, maybe a little bit too much, we've bought into both of those truths, that the the problem is out there, and that I need to push myself forward and upward in order to project strength and power, because that's where I'm going to make my mark in this world, and Jesus is going to address that. And Christ is going to call us, He's going to call us up, and He's going to call us out into a different posture and a different way of life. The Christian character traits that Jesus is going to talk about this morning are mourning and meekness. The culture that we live in today says, blessed are those who rise above and possess power and influence. And we love to elevate people into positions of influence and power, not because of their brokenness or their meekness, but because they are people of strength and power. And Jesus is going to remind us that is not life in the kingdom of God. So Jesus continues His master class in Matthew chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. Will you read them with me? If you're there, say a word. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus says, those who are mourning and those who are meek are happier and actually more blessed than others. Because these are the types of people who receive and live in the reality of the kingdom of God. And meekness and mourning actually make us more like Jesus. I love this quote, uh, Seth Godin, he's a writer and a pastor, he had this quote about the Beatitudes. He says, um, I think I have, I don't know if I had it up on screen, but he says, Um, These are difficult teachings, but he says, people like us do things like this. People like us do things like this. This is how we live out our faith. And so, this is going to be a little bit of a two-parter here as we learn how to do things like this. And the first one is verse 4 where Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus essentially is saying, happy are the unhappy. Who loves to mourn and grieve in here? Anyone? Just, I love to just kind of like soak in the difficulties of life. None of us do. And he's like, but happy and blessed are those people. And you're like, mm, come on, Jesus, that, that's not right. Blessed are those who are not blessed because they've had loss in their life and are still grieving and mourning that loss. It's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. I think a lot of us have a hard time seeing this to be true because we have a hard time facing the reality of just pain and grief and suffering. Our culture has a hard time with this. 
We raise our kids in such a way that we don't want them to experience pain and suffering and loss. And so we protect them, which is not bad, but we don't want them to experience anything like this. But Jesus says we're actually blessed when we do. Christianity as a whole, I think, has a really hard time with grief, loss, pain, and suffering because as Christians, we're supposed to live the hashtag blessed life, right? Everything's supposed to be great. There's a whole segment of churches within Christianity that tell us God's will for you is to be prosperous in Christ, that if you have sickness in you, it's something that you've got going on inside of you. If you just have more faith, God will bless you and He will heal you, and it's all dependent upon you. But you're supposed to be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. You're children of the King. You're supposed to have everything that this life has to offer. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, it's like the exact opposite of even some of the things that many Christians teach in churches today. But He says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who experience pain, suffering, weeping, lamenting. In fact, there's an entire book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. It's all about lament and grief and mourning. He says, blessed are those who have experienced death. Now, scholars believe that there's kind of a twofold meaning to this beatitude. The first one it's because it's like, what are we supposed to be mourning over? Like, blessed are those who mourn. Well, what is the, uh, what, what is the cause of that mourning? And, and New Testament scholars think there might be a two-sided nuance to this teaching. And the first one is this, is that maybe Jesus is saying, blessed are those who mourn over their own depravity and sin. Because coming after this one, Jesus says, uh, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so there's a sense where Jesus could be and quite possibly is talking about the fact that you and I need to have a better practice of mourning and grieving what my sin has done to me and to other people and to my relationship with God. That I have to mourn my own sin. He says, blessed are those who are totally depraved and mourn and grieve over their sin and what it does to God. Paul in Romans chapter 3 says, for the wages of our, the penalty for our sin is what? It's death. Mourning over what my sin does. My sin leads me to death. The things that I've done to other people will lead to death. If I'm left to my own devices, if I'm left to my own sinfulness, if I don't allow God to do the inner work of, of my life and to work out my salvation and to work out the sanctification in my own life, what, will, what the result of my own sin is always death. And so, therefore, Jesus might be saying, hey, Christian, grieve and mourn and weep, gnash the teeth over your sin. I love it. The Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, he says this. He says, what a wretched man I am. What a wretched man. This is the Apostle Paul, right? It goes, God and Jesus, and then like... Mother Teresa, and then maybe like the Apostle Paul's up there, you know, somewhere on the hierarchy of like righteousness. And Paul is like, what a wretched man I am. Paul later on in his letter to Timothy says that Jesus Christ came to this world to save sinners of which I am the worst. The Apostle Paul says he was the worst of sinners. A man like that, I think, has a proper understanding of what sin has done to his life and what sin has done to other people in his life and what his sin has done to Jesus Christ. Because look, he says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Jesus might be saying in here, blessed and happy are you who see yourself for who you really are. And you grieve and mourn over our depravity. Confession, repentance, Jesus may be saying here, are the pathways to receiving the eternal comfort. Think about that. When we come to Christ to receive salvation, the eternal comfort, I mean, how many of us are looking forward to heaven? You know what I'm saying? Right? The older we get, the more we look forward to heaven as things start breaking down. Some of you are a little more seasoned than I am. You're like, amen to that. I get that, right? Like, I'm ready. I'm ready, man. Let's do this, right? I want to go be with Jesus, right? Because we recognize like, that things are breaking down within us, but we know that if we want to receive the eternal comfort that Jesus Christ gives to us, it begins with mourning and grieving over our own sin and the effects that that's had. It's called repentance, and it's called confession. And so Jesus might be saying, hey, guys, the pathway to the kingdom of God includes this mourning over our own sin. The other side of the coin that New Testament uh, scholars think Jesus may be talking about is a little bit more of a simple explanation, maybe the more obvious one, is just blessed are those who mourn. But blessed are those who have experienced loss because you have seen the Holy Spirit's role in bringing you comfort. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus may be simply alluding to the issue of loss, loss of loved ones, loss of family members, friends, loss of job, maybe unmet expectations and the, the grieving process you go through with that. And Jesus says, it's okay. It's okay to mourn. It's okay. It's part of life. And you actually will find blessing on the other side of that because you're not walking through it alone. Psalm 23, most of us probably know it. We've heard it at funerals before, but the psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, though I walk through the valley, I will not fear. Why? Because that's where you're with me. You will guide me through it. Now, all of us, when we experience some sort of grief, I thought about like the, the five stages of grief, and I just was meditating on the process that we go through to get to the other side of grief. And if you've lost a loved one, you know you've probably gone through these various stages yourself, and these are necessary stages to go through. But I was, I was reading about them more this week, and I thought, man, at every single stage of grief, there's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as the perfect comforter, speaks into all five stages of grief. The first stage of grief is called denial. If you've ever experienced tragic death of a loved one, you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is not happening. And there's a sense of denial there, or you lose a job, or you know, some sort of unmet expectation, you're like, no, no, this is not happening to me. And a lot of people get stuck in this thing of denial where they go, this is not happening, or I don't want to deal with it, right? I'm denying that this is affecting me. I'm going to push it to the side. I'm not going to deal with it. But the first stage is an important stage. And it's important to realize as a Christ follower that even in that sense of denial, the Holy Spirit speaks into our lives and helps us deal with reality, that the Holy Spirit can speak in and say, no, 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 it's okay to face the loss that you're going through because that is a part of the grieving process. And then once we go through the denial phase, the second stage of grief is what they call anger. We've all gone through that when we've lost someone. We get angry at God. We get angry at others. We take out our anger in really destructive ways on ourselves and on people that we love. We get into fights with our siblings after moms died. We take out that on other people. It's necessary, but you don't want to get stuck there. And I thought, man, even in the midst of like our anger, the Holy Spirit speaks into that and gives us peace. I even think about like 
you know, when I lost my father several years ago, like I went through that stage of anger. I was, I was angry with God. And one thing that I realized even in my own anger was the Holy Spirit can handle angry Chris. The Holy Spirit can handle angry Chris. And the Holy Spirit will speak to me even in my anger, but that's a necessary part that we must go through. The third stage of grief is what they call bargaining, right? It's like, okay, well, God, if this, then I will this. If you do this, I'll do, the, you know, I'll do that. And we, we bargain with God and with other people to try to work through our grief and to get out of that. And I think like even the Holy Spirit in the midst of our bargaining gives us not what we want, but He gives us what we need. I mean, if we got everything that we were bargaining for in the midst of our grief, our lives would be a total mess. If we got everything in life that we asked for, our lives would be a mess. But the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 I know what you need right now, but I'm not going to give you what you want in the midst of your bargaining. Fourth stage of grieving is depression. That's that phase where we just kind of sit in the room and we don't want to talk to people, we don't want to process, shades are down, maybe we sleep a lot more than we normally do. And man, but for the Christ follower, this is a stage that we can move through by the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is present with us in the midst of our depression and the Holy Spirit restores our hope. And then the final stage of grief is what they call acceptance. And that's just accepting that this is how things are now. Life is temporary for all of us. We will all experience loss. We will all mourn and grieve. And what the Holy Spirit wants us to do is He wants us to move through those stages of grief so that we can come out on the other side and receive the blessing of God's comfort through it all. Praise God that God does not leave us alone. So, the promise that Jesus makes here is that when you're mourning and you're grieving and you feel alone, God's answer to that is, my presence will be your comfort. My presence will be your comfort. Did you guys know that really, when he boils down to it, there's only two faith systems that have pain and suffering at the center or the foundation of its faith. Christianity and Buddhism are the only two faith systems that have pain and suffering as the center that the faith is built on. Buddhism, one of its core tenets is life is suffering. That's what it is. Buddha said life is suffering. And Buddha's quest for enlightenment was not a way to deal with the suffering, but what? To escape the suffering. So through personal enlightenment, you're able to escape the physical pain and suffering of this life. And if you learn how to become an enlightened person, you can have complete separation of body and soul, and you will not experience the pain and the sufferings that this world has to give to you. Buddhism says, escape the pain and suffering. That's the key. And it's a lie because we can escape pain and suffering, can we? Christianity has pain and suffering at the center of it by saying that pain and suffering is a normal part of it. But the good news is, is that we have a God that pulls us through it, walks us through it, has experienced it Himself, and brings you salvation and redemption from the sin and the suffering that every single one of us goes through. God says there is purpose to our pain and suffering in this world. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. See, the promise of the kingdom is that God actually steps into our mess. He steps into the problem of our personal sin and rescues us and saves us and redeems us, which eventually leads to an eternal comfort in heaven. He also steps into our earthly mourning and brings us the comfort through the presence of His Holy Spirit. Guys, God, when you're going through your mourning, God understands, He is involved, and He sits with you through it all. That's the comfort that Jesus is talking about. And then He goes on, 
say, blessed are the mourn, those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And then Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So there's the mourning and there's the meek. Now, meek is a confusing word. Meek is not weak, okay? Say that. Meek is not weak, okay? That's those two things, even though they rhyme, they don't actually, they're not, it's not the same thing. Meekness is not weakness. Weakness, in the way that the New Testament translators moved the Aramaic that Jesus actually spoke into the Greek word, the Greek phrase, is the Greek word prus. Say prus. Prus. That's the word for meek. Prus essentially means gentle, humble, considerate, courteous, and self-controlled. That's what meekness is. And meekness is not just an internal posture or a way to think about myself, but it's actually a posture towards others. Because meekness is a controlled desire to see other people's interests advance above our own. Meekness is also having the ability to, con- to control, exert power, or dominate, but you don't use it. Meekness means I have the power to lay down the hammer right now, but I'm not going to. Jesus says Himself in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, says, I am gentle and humble in heart, yet even on the cross He could have called down legions of angels to pull Him down off the cross, but He chose not to. That's what meekness does. Meekness has the ability, but has the self-control not to. And we do not enter into our spiritual inheritance in Christ by our own might or by our power or our pride or by our greatness, but we enter in through our meekness, humility, and submission. And so, Jesus is reminding us as Christ followers that Christians are to be meek, humble servants, gentle, considerate of others, and self-controlled. I wonder how the people that heard the master class for the first time thought about how did they hear this phrase? Two things to give us context as to what they hear, and this is going to help us live this out in our own lives, is number one is that the people that Jesus was speaking to on the Sermon on the Mount were a people that longed to have their land back. These were Israelites living in Israel under Roman occupation. The promised land that God had given to them was no longer theirs. In fact, it had not been theirs anymore for almost 700 years. The Israelites eventually during the time of the prophets were taken over by the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Romans. For 700 years, the promised land was not their land, and Israel longed for a Messiah that would restore the kingdom of Israel back to the Jews, to throw out the Romans, to throw out the Persians, to throw out the Babylonians, and there's going to be a, come a day in which the Messiah would come, he'd be, he'd be the king of kings. And he would restore the nation of Israel back to its political power and its military power and its cultural power once again. But Jesus is saying here to these people who are listening, he says, blessed are the meek. And what he is saying is, there is a greater reward in heaven and there is a greater reward for you, those who have just lost something. There is a greater reward in the end if you just stay humble and meek and allow God to be God and you do what you do. And instead of Jesus saying, hey, all of you, take back what was taken from you. Pick up the sword. Protest. Exert power. Post on Facebook on how things aren't going your way anymore and you want to take it back. Get angry about it. Jesus says, no, 
Blessed are the meek. Because this land is not your reward. You hear me? This world is not our reward. It's temporary. It's going to burn. And if our eyes are just so fixed on fixing and getting back this, Jesus is like, man, you're selling God so short. You're selling God so short. It's the meek who will not just inherit the promised land, but it's the meek who will inherit what? The earth. You get everything in God's kingdom. Everything that you would ever want. Now, I'm not saying don't vote, don't have an opinion, don't seek justice. I'm not saying, don't hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. But this puts into question, Christians, which kingdom do you love more and which kingdom do you desire more? Do you desire the community and the country that you want? And that you think is the right way? Or do you live a life of meekness knowing that this is not your home? Now, it doesn't downplay what we do in our daily lives. People's lives matter. Justice matters. Souls matter. But Jesus is telling all of these people who are still upset that Israel is not theirs. It belongs to the Romans. He says, guys, this is not your home. It's a hard lesson for us. That's why it's countercultural. The disciples didn't even get this after the resurrection. If you're reading Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Jesus rose from the grave. We celebrated that a few weeks ago. Pretty big deal, Right? One of the first questions the disciples asked him in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 is, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel again? Are, are you the king? Are you going to give us back our land? And Jesus is like, oh, man, you still don't get it. You still don't get it. Because that's not how we do things. That's not how we do things. This is why Jesus rebuked Peter when he drew the sword on the Roman soldier when they went to arrest Jesus. And he cut off the ear of the soldier and Jesus rebukes Peter and he's like, that's not how we do things here. We do not pick up the sword because the Christ follower lives a life of meekness, not exerting power. Man, you know... Here's a way to tell someone who has not bought into this beatitude yet or not, is that the news makes them angry. That one stung a little bit, didn't it? When the news makes us angry and we want to fight, maybe Jesus is like, hey, that's not how we do it here. You have the ability and you have the power, but those of the kingdom choose not to use it. Why? Because greater is the reward later. Just something to think about. Some, I'm, not, I'm not casting you, just something to think about. So next time you're watching the news and you're like, <laughs> your spouse can be like, blessed are the meek, <laughs> right? Blessed are the meek. Here's the other thing, too, and this, this kind of piggybacks on this, is Jesus it seems to be quoting Psalm chapter 37, verse 11. So if you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 37, 30, chapter 37, I want to read this, because what Psalm 37 does is it, it gives an, an encouragement to the people of Israel on what it means to live a life of meekness. So often, rabbis would use, like, one verse, and it would trigger, like, the, it would trigger like the uh, reference either in their history or in the Hebrew scriptures, right? When Jesus is on the cross, his father, for, you know, or uh, uh, when Jesus says on the cross, um, I'm totally blanking, quotes a psalm, that happens to me too, brain farts. But what Jesus does in this beatitude is he quotes 
Psalm 37, verse 11. Look what it says. It says, but the meek will, will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Okay, and you're like, okay, like the meek will inherit the earth. Jesus is quoting Psalm 37, 11, but let's read the entire psalm in context. I think it's going to give us a broader understanding of what meekness is in light of the kingdom of God. Psalm 37, verse 1, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong, for like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will no longer or will be no more. And though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I mean, man, what a contrast to the world that we live in that is just so full of the materialism, pride, power, to take what's yours. And God says to the church, I understand that things are a little crazy right now. Things are evil. People are abusing power. There's injustices in the world that you think that this isn't the promised land anymore. I know that you're frustrated and upset about the state of your life and the state, the children that you're trying to raise. And I know that you want to fight. I know you want to retaliate, cancel, call out, riot, protest, boycott, exert your power. But this world, this country, is not the kingdom of God. It's not your kingdom. It's temporary, and I'm in charge. So if you want happiness and contentment and to be blessed by God, maybe a posture of weakness is the path. Because this people like us do things like this. People like us do things like this. So when you're in a posture of meekness and humility, and even when you feel powerless, remember, Jesus says, my battle will become your reward. This is my battle for my kingdom. And you'll be the recipients of it if you just hold tight. The way of Christ is different than the world that we live in, isn't it? It's a little bit convicting. It's a little bit humbling. Maybe some of you are angry right now. You're like, I don't like Chris. I'm just the messenger. You don't like Jesus. Ooh, that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's hard, but the reality is people like us do things like this, guys. It's what it means to be a Christ follower. It's what it means to sit at the feet of the master who's given us his master class on what it means to embrace our mourning and our grief and what it means to pursue lives of meekness. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word as hard as it may be, as countercultural as it may be. We're just so grateful that saints throughout the church have preserved these words so that we can hear your voice, we can know your truth, that your word will still function in our lives like a double-edged sword. It'll cut through us, it'll encourage us, it'll push us. 
It'll help us become more like Jesus. Lord, I pray for my friends in here that they're maybe are going through loss right now. Um, I know there are friends in here that have lost loved ones recently. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be their comfort today. And I know there are others of us in here too that we, uh, we confess to you, God, that we want this kingdom to be ours and we fight for the wrong things. Will you help us, Jesus, to fight for the things that you fought for, to care about the things that you care about, to dedicate our lives to that which you gave your life for? Because all of this, Jesus, we just want more of you and we want to become more like you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.